hope you had a wonderful feast together. Um, this evening we have a, a real blessing coming to us from, from a friend and colleague of mine, uh, C. John Collins, Jack Collins, okay? Uh, he's been doing some special work on the reading of the early chapters of Genesis and the issues of genre in relationship to that and how that needs to be adjusted and all sorts of interesting discussion going on. And uh, I look forward to what he's going to say uh, in these times. So Jack, welcome. Thank you for coming. Lord be with you. <laughs> Thank you. What a pleasure to be with you, and uh, really a pleasure to be back here on this campus. I suppose I, I would be a, uh, a senior research fellow emeritus. I, I suppose that's, that's the proper designation of my status. Quite enjoyed my year here last year, <clears throat> and um, uh, enjoyed the fellowship of the Henry Center and of those associated with it and the hospitality of this campus. C.S. Lewis uh, had a day job. His, uh, we, we mostly know him through, uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Ortland over there, we know him as the uh, source of some of our imagination, don't we? But uh, uh, his um, uh, actual job was as a scholar of English literature. And in 1940, he gave a set of lectures on John Milton's poem, Paradise Lost. And the opening sentence of these published lectures uh, puts the whole interpretive task right into a nutshell. The first qualification for judging and also interpreting any piece of workmanship from a corkscrew to a cathedral is to know what it is, what it was intended to do, and how it is meant to be used. So straight away, Lewis has directed our attention to three aspects of a work of literary craftsmanship. What it is, issues of things like genre, which is actually a difficult term, um, which I'm not discussing very much right now, style, register, and so forth. What's the relationship between the literary form and the content of the work? Then what it was intended to do. What effect does the work aim to produce in its users? And how is it meant to be used? What kind of users are envisioned uh, by the work? What knowledge and beliefs do they share uh, with the author? What kind of social setting is the normal locus of usage? So I want to focus on these questions as they apply to the biblical creation story of Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, to listen to some people, the reason the Lord uh, provided that story to us is so that we'd have something to argue about. Uh, and of course we all snicker and rightly so, but it is true that that is how people behave and we're going to try to do better. So let me use Lewis's opening sentence as a guide for our consideration. Can we say what kind of thing the creation story is? Now there's a long tradition uh, amongst both Jewish and Christian scholars uh, in seeing the biblical story as a polemic against the stories that the pagan peoples told. We find that going at least as far back as the Jewish author Josephus in the first century AD and the Christian author Eusebius in the early fourth century. As they see it, the goal of the biblical story is to tell the tale the right way. And I think they have something to teach us on that point, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Can we say more about the kind of thing that it is? Yes, and let's just notice a few features of the Genesis story, uh, the way that the story is told. <clears throat> First of all, there's the language level, and the, uh, the way the story is told is, is in what we can call exalted prose. By that, I notice, first of all, that the pericope consists of an almost liturgical recounting of God's achievements. Uh, we, we see that, you know, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God said this, and that happened, and, and so forth. Now, uh, some authors, like uh, Moshe Weinfeld, have even called the passage liturgical in origin. Now, I don't quite agree with all that lies behind that statement, uh, but I do judge that Weinfeld or Weinfeld, if, if we want to be careful, uh, has captured something about the passage that is really there. Secondly, we have a highly patterned presentation of the days. Each day begins with, and God said, and it closes with, and there was evening, and there was morning, the nth day. 
Now, quite aside from the question of what kind of days they were, we can see that uh, they follow the pattern of a human work week. Each workday begins as the laborer goes out to work, and it ends with the evening, and in between the evening and the morning is the nighttime, when the whole family rests from their daily work. And in the morning, they get up and do it all over again until the Sabbath, where the Israelite human beings rest just like God rested. Thirdly, the narrative is exceedingly broad stroke in its taxonomies. Uh, here's what I mean by that. In 112, we find the uh, plant life falling into two categories, the plants or the small plants and the trees. In 124, the land animals fall into three categories, livestock, which would be domesticable stock animals, uh, creeping things, which would be small animals like mice and lizards and spiders, and then beasts of the earth, which would be the larger wild animals, whether they be game animals like uh, deer and antelope, uh, or the larger predators, uh, lions and tigers and bears. <clears throat> and uh, no single species other than man gets its proper Hebrew name. And nor do we learn how the earth brought forth vegetation. This is a point that has come up uh, in this conversation this weekend. Uh, nor how the animals appeared in their respective environments. So whatever processes might or might not have been involved are just not commented on at all. Uh, I think we can say that the first users of this text, had they been looking for a useful taxonomy, say to help them in their work of farming, would have asked for something more specific, unless, unless they knew that taxonomic utility was not the purpose or proper use of the text. So, and fourthly, the name for the heavens, the rakia, expanse, is unusual, and it's probably rhetorically high or poetic, if you like that way of describing it. Fifth, the sun and the moon are given very unusual names, elusive names, the greater light and the lesser light, names that are not normal for the rest of the Bible. Uh, when Psalm 137, 136, I should say, echoes our pericope, there the author speaks of the great lights, but he, uh, he also explicitly mentions the sun and the moon. Sixth, God takes a rest on his Sabbath. And every faithful person is going to think, first of all, yeah, I know what that's like. And then he's going to think, no, I don't know what that's like because we're talking about God. Um, and God never gets tired. And then seventh, the events are, in the very nature of the case, namely creation, unique, which supplies a good reason for the unique style. Robert Longacre was a linguist uh, at University of Texas and also with the Summer Institute of Linguistics, and he applied his linguistic ideas to the study of the Bible. He said this of Genesis 1. He actually wrote this in a memo to the PCA Study Committee on Creation, of which I was a member. He said, whether we want to call such diction and discourse structure a poem or not is somewhat arbitrary. Gilbert Rorison was a 19th century English theologian part of the response to the infamous work Essays and Reviews, and he called Genesis 1 the oldest and sublimest poem in the world. And Alexander Heidel, a distinguished Assyriologist uh, and also a conservative Christian, wrote this, the whole chapter of Genesis 1 is written in a solemn tone and in dignified prose which easily glides over into poetry. So, the story is certainly a narrative, and yet in its style, it's much higher than your usual narrative. And so I've called it exalted prose. <clears throat> and my purpose for talking about this is simply an application of the conviction that God inspired the Bible to be the right tool for its job. And if we can get a good idea of what kind of tool it is, then we can discern what kind of job it's right for. Uh, maybe, and just maybe, it can do that same sort of job for us as it did for ancient Israel. Well, let me drag a few more things into this discussion, and then we'll see if we can't tie it all together. Uh, and uh, let's move on to what, what can be called audience criticism. To whom was this passage first addressed? I don't mean criticism like what the prophets would do, but namely simply understanding who that uh, audience was. To whom was this passage first addressed? Now, Jews and Christians have traditionally associated the Pentateuch with Moses, and I count myself a happy traditionalist on that account. And that means that the book of Genesis has as its first audience the people of Israel who are about to follow Joshua across the Jordan River. 
uh, that group of people and then subsequent generations that would be their heirs. Each generation that would read this would see themselves connected to the first generation that received this. They're primarily subsistence farmers with plenty of experience tending animals and growing crops. They have a good practical sense of how the weather works. They have a good practical sense of how the kinds of things that they encounter in the world, like plants and animals, wild and domestic and pestilential, how they all work. So uh, providing information on these things uh, would seem not to be the purpose of Genesis 1. What temptations do these people face? Well, there's two pretty obvious ones that have a bearing on our subject. One is the fact that they're peasants and they're encountering what we might call higher cultures, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and even the peoples of the Western Levant, Canaan and Ugarit. These people have buildings, they have cities and technology and literature, they have a history. What do the people of Israel have? They've been brickfield slaves in Egypt and then pastoral nomads in the Sinai Desert. And because of this, they can easily think that they're of no value. Uh, these higher cultures are superior not only in power, but also in their right to be admired. Surely the only thing to do then is to imitate them. Well, this temptation comes through in Numbers 13, where the spies that Moses had sent report on what they saw in the land of Canaan. We came to the land to which you sent us. It, it does flow with milk and honey, and, and here's some of its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all along the Jordan. Now, Joshua and Caleb uh, tried to convince the people of Israel that the Lord would, in fact, enable them to take the land. But the other ten spies led the people in disbelief. Well, I see here not simply the fear factor, uh, being afraid of these uh, people, but also the sense of inferiority. In verse 33, the unfaithful spies say, we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. Now, Joshua and Caleb replied to this. We might paraphrase their words with what Paul said so many centuries later, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. But the people, of course, didn't obey. Well, the other obvious temptation also comes from the fact that the audiences throughout the history of Israel, in fact, most of the history of humankind, were peasants, utterly dependent on external conditions, like the weather, the fertility of their animals, and even the fertility of their own families. Now, Palestine gives you just the right combination of soil type and latitude and climate cycle of rain and sunshine to allow you to grow certain kinds of crops and to raise certain kinds of animals. In particular, you need to be able to depend on the rains coming in the fall, starting within a few weeks after Rosh Hashanah, uh, the biblical feast of trumpets, and then finishing in the spring sometime around Passover. You need enough of it to fall, about 23 inches per year. That's the same, as a matter of fact, as the annual rainfall in London or Cambridge. Uh, it's about half of the annual rainfall, say, over in a place like South Bend. Then, of course, you worry about pests, not to mention invading armies or marauding bandits, and you need a stable social system with a reliable system of justice. How do you ensure the reliability of this pattern? Well, the deities that the other peoples worshipped promised to do exactly that to have the right mix of rain and sunshine, to make the livestock fertile, to bring your own babies safely into the world, and lots of them, uh, to avenge violations of the social order. It might be easy for us when we read the prophets to think how stupid the people of Israel were to resort to these other deities uh, and to include them in their worship of the Lord. Well, it was certainly wrong, but we should see how vulnerable uh, these people were to the temptation. They, they uh, lived in an era in which idolatry was not an overworked metaphor, as it is now, but rather an actual thing, uh, and there's a motivation for it. I'm going to suggest to you that a responsible reading of the creation story must show how it addresses the needs of the audience, and these two things are right there at the top. 
Thirdly, the social setting of normal usage. Well, if that's the audience, in what social setting uh, might they have normally used the text? Was it something they typically read quietly at home, perhaps wishing they had a copy of my Genesis 1 to 4 commentary ready to hand, <laughs> or in some other way? Well, the Pentateuch itself gives us the clue. Uh, it was to be read aloud. Uh, initially, they were to ensure that they read it every seven years in Deuteronomy 31. Eventually, it was read portion by portion every Sabbath in the Holy Convocation, mentioned in Leviticus 23. We have some biblical examples of public readings at crucial moments in Israel's history, such as the catalyst for King Josiah's reforms in 2 Kings 23. Uh, we have the renewal of the restored community's pledge to be true to God under Ezra's leadership in Nehemiah 8 and verse 3. Well, these are moving scenes, and we can guess that they were heightened examples of what we should normally expect. The public reading helps the community to refresh its sense of identity. This is who we are. This is where we came from. This is why God called us into being. This is how we got to where we are now. These are the things that we should be striving for. Well, certainly families were expected to discuss the material. As Deuteronomy 6 says, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. But uh, this family discussion depended on the faithful reading week by week. And it put into action each member's responsibility to love God deeply and sincerely with all their heart, soul, and might. And what is this that the priests are to read aloud and to explain to the people of Israel? Well, we can see that uh, Genesis 1 and 2 work together to form the front end of Genesis 1 through 11, which is the front end of the whole book of Genesis, which is the first of the five books of Moses. And the books of Moses served as a kind of constitution for Israel. Israel is God's people, the people that he chose so that through them he could bless the entire world. This constitution comes in the form of a continuous narrative. And the narrative gave to ancient Israel a big story. It explained who they were, why they were in the world. It invited them to take their place in the story as it plays out from here. For Christians, it's a part of our big story as well. So Genesis as a whole sets the stage for Israel's big story. It addresses people about to follow Joshua across the Jordan River, uh, making sure that they really believe themselves to be the proper heirs of Abraham the person that God promised the land to. And Genesis contrasts with the other big stories uh, told by other peoples. For them, the gods made humankind to do the work that they, that they didn't like doing. Uh, and uh, these stories enforced a stratified social system with the vast majority of people down there at the bottom doing what the higher levels told them to do. And they mustn't complain or question. So then, what is the text there to do? We can pull everything together now and answer the questions that Lewis posed to us. What it, was intended to do, what it is, what it was intended to do, and how it was meant to be used. We have in the creation story the beginning of the big story that defines Israel, but which also defines everyone. That's why the account has to be read in gathered public worship, where the people want to be most truly themselves. It's also told, it's also why the story is told in the attractive and imagistic fashion that it has to grab their imaginations and to hold their loyalty. The people of Israel are about to set foot in the land where they're going to face all manner of temptations to fall away from their loyalty to God their maker. The land belongs to God. In fact, the whole world belongs to God. And in the creation story, if there's any other deity, it's got nothing to do. The whole world, in fact, is obedient to the command of the one true God. And that's the God who has made himself known to Israel. How are they to ensure the well-being of their crops and their livestock and their families? By loving God and staying true to his instruction. They mustn't try to hedge their bets by resorting to these other deities. Besides that, they should allow this story to help them to admire the God who made the world. The mountains, the valleys, the forests, the rivers and the plains, the deserts, even the seas. God made them all. The plants and the animals living in these balanced ecosystems. What an incredible work of craftsmanship. God doesn't view the world as a rival for our affections. 
we can love and admire Him more fully as we love and admire the world that He made. Now, an Israelite would have been mostly concerned with figuring out how to farm well. We have the advantage of adding to that the development of science, which opens up even more avenues for wonder. Now, Genesis doesn't really advocate specific scientific theories about the things that it describes. Genesis is neither outmoded ancient science, nor is it authoritative science that challenges modern scientific theories. Rather, it's, it, uh, it serves to reinforce the boundaries that good critical thinking has set for whatever theories we're considering, especially when it comes to questions of human uniqueness and of God's action in the world. We can save that for some other discussion. And we see the image of God in the making of humankind. Uh, remember how I said that God's work is presented as if it were a work week that its audience would recognize, and the same is true of his Sabbath. But a good audience would go beyond just recognizing that. They'd begin to shape their work week and Sabbath to be more like God's, more loving care, more thoughtfulness, more attention to how to bring out the best in God's world. The rhetorical figure here is called a homology. It's a special kind of analogy. Uh, you have an analogy between God's activity and something you're familiar with, but then once you uh, perceive the analogy, you begin to change your own practice of the activity to be more like the way that God does it. Just as like God is a father to his children, you perceive that even if, you, if your experience is with a bad example of fathering. Uh, and uh, so you perceive it by analogy, but then if you're a member of the sensitive faithful, you begin to change your own uh, practice of fathering to be more like the way that God fathers his own children. Well, the same way with this work week. They're already familiar with the work week. This is a given uh, for Israel, pre-existing knowledge. Uh, and uh, this is there to uh, uh, invite them to adjust their practice of the work week to be more like God's. That is to say, an ideal audience would appreciate that the ideal human community is one that tries to imitate God. And they'd work at that not only in their work, but in all their social relationships to conduct themselves according to steadfast love and faithfulness. God abounds in these, and they should aim to do so as well. That's the purpose of the Mosaic Law, to protect a community in which these things can flourish. Uh, and this goes beyond just their fellow Israelites. In the history of God's dealings with humankind, he keeps making fresh starts on Adam. There's Noah. And then there's Abram, and Abram is to be blessed, just like Adam and Noah were, be, were blessed. But Abram is blessed so that in him all the families of the earth will find blessing. And then this addresses the cultural inferiority that Israelites surely felt. No culture is worthy of honor unless it is founded on the flourishing of God's image in man. And these other cultures, for all their achievements, fail on that score. In fact, we often find these other deities requiring their worshipers to do hideous things, like sacrifice their children or to institute sacred prostitution. Now, there's no reason to believe that uh, these other peoples uh, actually liked these hideous practices. In fact, some of the inscriptions that you find uh, from uh, Carthage seem to suggest that it's every bit as painful as you might imagine to have sacrificed your children to Moloch. But they felt like they had no choice. Israel, therefore, brings good news to the world. The very human flourishing that we all yearn for is on offer from the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth. So if I were to summarize the doctrine of creation, uh, I would, uh, I, I've, I've noticed as we've been talking about creation, uh, uh, there, there's a grammatical or philological a fact we ought to point out, namely that the English word creation is the kind of noun, it's very similar to the uh, Hebrew noun baria and the uh, Greek noun katesis uh, and uh, the Latin noun creatio. Uh, it's, it can uh, designate an action or it can designate the product of that action. And so, and so when we're talking about the doctrine of creation, we've sort of flipped back and forth. And of course, we don't really want to set these in opposition to each other, do we? Uh, because the doctrine of creation as a whole includes both. So God made all things, uh, and I'm using here uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, 
And um, uh, I, I know you can't improve perfection, and so please don't uh, report to the outside world that I, that I have adjusted the shorter catechism, but uh, <laughs> I have done so nonetheless. Uh, so God made all things from nothing, which means that God and only God is self-sufficient. The world depends on him, but he doesn't depend on it. When he made the world, he made something different than he is, something that's less than he is. He made all things by the word of his power. When God wanted something to be a certain way, he spoke a word, and that's just the way that it was. And unlike the stories that other people told, God didn't have to overcome any resistant forces. The world is perfectly obedient to him. He made uh, the world in the space of six days. By using the pattern of a, of a human work week, God shows us how the ideal human laborer does his work and takes his rest as well. Fourthly, all very good. Good means that it deserves our admiration because it suits just what God wants. This is what the creation was like at the first, and uh, as a matter of fact, there is a sense in which it still applies. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 4, everything created by God is good. Uh, so sin and dysfunction are, in fact, foreign invaders of God's good creation. Fifthly, so that it bears his imprint, the whole creation displays to us something of what God is like. It helps us to know and to worship him. Now, we've got to be careful, uh, and actually one of those questions that was raised is what sorts of things does it tell us about what, is, what God is like uh, and so forth, but uh, it, uh, it does nevertheless bear his imprint. And then finally, as the right kind of place in which we live out our story. The creation account tells us how the story that defines you and me got underway. So Christians are able to affirm these things even if we disagree over some of the details. Francis Schaeffer had his notion of freedoms and limitations. There's a range of views that good people can take and yet there are boundaries set by the Bible and by good sense. Uh, plenty more that I'd like to say right now but uh, one of my uh, retired colleagues used to talk about the five B's, be brief, brother, be brief, uh, and I'm trying to uh, observe his advice. <clears throat> uh, at this point, what, here's what I want to leave you with. The first thing about you and me and everyone else around us and about the world is that God made us all. Uh, in fact, God was pleased with what he made. He actually liked it. Since we're Christians, we must also think of God as the Redeemer, but his purpose in redemption is to restore his broken creatures so that they function properly, uh, as they did at first. So our Christian faith doesn't take us away from the world that God made. It equips us to live in it, to appreciate it for that magnificent work that it is. God doesn't treat the world as a rival for our affections. As we enjoy it, we enjoy our maker. Thank you. All right, so let me take some questions. Questions, not brickbats, please. Sir, thank you very much. Very concise and informative, and maybe the food for the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Please don't report me to the Presbyterian authority. <laughs> I beg of you. People have been saying that doctrine should be found on the literal sense of scripture. Right. So at the end, you give us these six doctrinal points. I agree with them all. But I, I wonder if you could relate it to where you started Lewis's uh, statement about knowing what the thing is, what it was intended to do. Can you connect that statement of Lewis to the literal sense, or would you not, or you not see a connection? Yes, I, I think that the literal that that that's an, that what Lewis has given us is a helpful exposition of what we should mean by the literal sense, um, and, and that I mean as as you you know uh, probably better than anybody else in this room that word literal just bedevils all these conversations, uh, and and it turns into a kind of literalism. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the literalism that that we encounter, say on on. Um, um, from some very fundamentalist people is also the literalism that lies behind a lot of biblical criticism. In fact, James Barr says precisely that, that, uh, uh, that literalism or the literal, what he calls the literal sense, what we can really call literalism, is at the foundation of biblical criticism. Uh, and, um, and James Barr is a classic example of a very talented person who 
qualifies as a failed reader of the biblical material, for be a failure to apprehend the actual sense that, that is intended. Yes, sir. I think in, uh, of, uh, you know, toward the end of Genesis 1, uh, Genesis, I give you dominion, it's a good rule. Uh, the, the way that you set this apart in the of Israel, uh, is there anything that, uh, that that context would help us to better understand those words? Right. Especially in ways that we have maybe used right. those words. So, um, and, and again, actually, uh, St. Louis is, uh, is helpful in, in that as well, in his reflections on the Psalms. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah. Um, the, the, um, what, what, we, what we need to appreciate is, again, the, 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 uh, the peasanthood of, of this first audience. So they're, they're actually familiar with a kind of exercising dominion already. Uh, and they're, they're familiar with a kind of exercising dominion from the point of view of having used stock animals. Uh, they know what donkeys are like. Uh, donkeys can be useful for carrying stuff, but donkeys also can be stubborn. Um, and what, what for us you know, can be called kindness to animals is, is not very costly compared to what it would mean for somebody who is an actual agricultural laborer uh, to show the right kind of benevolence to his stock animals. Um, that's well illustrated in one of the uh, James Herriot stories, All Creatures Great and Small, where a farmer, uh, a Yorkshire farmer, in very, very harsh conditions has had a horse do work for him all the horse's useful life, and then he gives it a retirement uh, once, once the horse is older, rather than, rather than asking Herriot to put the horse down. He uh, uh, feels that he owes it to the horse. And that's, that's something beautiful. Uh, and what we have to appreciate as Harriet presents it, and as would be true in Israel, uh, that's costly. Um, but, it, but it's also, uh, the, the beauty is there to draw us in. Yeah, you know, I'd really like to live in a place where that's true. Um, so the, the uh, uh, and, and what's interesting as well is that the terminology, um, for example, to subdue, uh, the, the verb there, is, is also used um, once or twice of Israel's subduing of the land in relation to the Canaanites. And, and uh, I think that the reason that, that, that's the, that Moses uses that term then in Genesis 1 is to evoke the Israelite conquest as a part of the whole pattern of showing that Israel's task in the land is to restore this creation pattern into proper functioning. So Israel's task in the land as uh, agricultural workers primarily is to, uh, to restore something of the created glory. And, and that's why you have all these passages in Leviticus, uh, particularly Leviticus and Deuteronomy, promising that the land would be fruitful and productive when Israel was faithful. Because uh, in the condition of faithfulness, you have the possibility of the land uh, being fruitful like the Garden of Eden was fruitful. Uh, and uh, as it were, evoking a cultural memory for all humankind. That, that's the basic idea there. So I'm very much in agreement with you last night. I, 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 want to, I want to help us to appreciate that this story is one that is there to give us an imagination uh, and, um, and especially to picture, uh, my golly, if, I, if my community could reflect something of that, I'd, I'd give my left arm uh, just to see it come to pass. And I'm not asked to give my left arm. I'm, I'm asked to love the maker of heaven and earth. I'm doing it. I'm in. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's the idea. Yes, sir. When I, uh, I really found the, the exalted prose discussion of language to be good, really helpful. Um, I, I just like your feedback on just the way that this conversation, this text is dealt with, especially probably a lot of our churches regarding the word history, right? right? And you, you didn't use the term at all, and, and, and I'd like to just, just speak a little bit about that. No one can make it defined very differently. He, there's a, I'm just in context, there's a movie that some people in my church went to called uh, is Genesis history. Bingo. So you see, so that would be the initial. When they hear the language, it's open prose. Yes. They might be the so just, I'd love for you to speak on that. Yeah. Well, um, so 
Uh, and this, this is a, 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 a topic of confusion. If people think that history is a literary kind, they're deeply mistaken. Because you, uh, history, you can tell history with lots of literary kinds. There are historical psalms, for example. So, so what we don't want to do is contrast history with poetry. Or take another example, there's a parable that Jesus tells uh, about um, uh, a, a, a landowner who hires out his vineyard to tenant farmers. And, and then he sends servants to collect the rents. And the tenant farmers uh, reject the servants. Some of them they, they kill or they cast them out and then the guy finally sends his son and they say, let's kill him and, and we'll take the inheritance. Well, everybody in the audience of Jesus knew full well that, that Jesus had just recounted the history of Israel. Um, but the literary form is uh, not, not the literary form that you would find, say, in Second Kings. Um, and so you have a variety of literary forms available to you for, uh, for telling history. History is not a literary form. History is about uh, what, what in linguistics is called referring. There are actual events and persons to which, uh, about which you are talking, and you're talking about them in a way that's appropriate to, uh, to them and appropriate for your communicative purposes. Um, and, um, I mean, we all, we, all of us do that, uh, and that's, that's normal human behavior. The idea that, that, that Genesis being prose is therefore straight prose is, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's not even wrong. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's really hard to start with, with, with the problems of, of that view. Um, and uh, so, I mean, no, uh, I, I mentioned Heidel and uh, Rorison and Longacre. None of them would, would uh, disagree with the notion that, that uh, what we have in Genesis is prose, Longacre especially as, as a grammarian. I mean, he's helped enormously in understanding how the Hebrew grammatical forms work and so forth. So, call it, so he says we can call it a poem, but, but what he's talking about is not the literary form, but rather about the style in which it's told. And so there, there are more factors than, than simply the literary form. There's the kind of language that's used and, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and, I, and I think that if we, over, if we oversimplify as that film has done, we've actually misled people. Um, uh, and I, I, I could say more, but maybe I should restrain myself. A and as, as a matter of fact, one of the people interviewed in that film, uh, Paul Nelson, actually distanced himself from the film when, when he recognizes that, that the film was presenting its audience with a false antithesis. It's either history or it's uh, irrelevant. Um, and uh, uh, Nelson doesn't think that and, and doesn't want to, didn't, uh, he asked not to be a part of that kind of antithesis, and the, the filmmakers, as I, I mean, I understand it, they didn't want to re-edit uh, what they had done, so they, they didn't honor his request. But, um, you know, that's, that, that kind of antithesis is, is not helpful. Most of these binary choices that were offered are, are not helpful. There's a couple of guys here from, uh, from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts here, uh, where I, I was mentored in probability theory by Alvin Drake, who used to say, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do a list of choices, they have to be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. And, and these binary choices are not, uh, are not that. Uh, so I always have uh, Alvin's voice ringing in my ears when I think about these things. Would you say, if I could ask, would you say that just a I'm trying to think of ways to helpfully give this kind of category then to the average evangelical in our church present. Any just authority on that? Well, um, I, I think, you know, just ask people, um, what range of options do you have if, if you want to tell about things that really happened? Uh, depending on what you want, and, and help them to appreciate that it depends on what you want to do with that narrative. Nathan, when, when you said that, that they're situated between MIT and Harvard, I thought of uh, dogs and cats living together and apocalypse and all that sort of thing, but <laughs> in any case, yes. <laughs> Sir, um, so 
a lot of this project that we spent time this weekend uh, doing has been trying to suss out ways that the doctrine of creation can, can speak in ways that are, are pertinent to concerns of modern science. So trying to avoid the science-based conflict right, model, but also trying to avoid the non overlapping and hysteria. These have nothing to do with each other. So my question is, can, can we do it if we're paying attention, as you know, Lewis says, to what the text is, what it's intended to do, and how it's intended to be right. given that an original audience far removed from our modern scientific concerns? Um, can that be done? Yep. How, how? Right. Well, uh, first, first of all, just the cautionary. Um, it's uh, that th there are uh, certainly that there are those of a you know, yeah, creationist and even some progressive creationists want to view Genesis as in so as some kind of authoritative science, and I think that's a mistake. But then others who try, you know, who who view Genesis as scripture but want to remove it from the discussion, call it ancient science. I think that's also a mistake. I think both of those are a mistake. They're asking something of Genesis that it's not giving. Uh, rather, what, what it does do is, um, it, Genesis assumes pre-existing knowledge on your part. Um, so for example, uh, you know, uh, you're an Israelite, okay, you know you're different from your donkey or your camel, okay? Um, and um, and you, you also, um, and you, what, what you need is a story that puts that difference in its proper perspective and then make, make sure that, uh, you know, that, that there are things that, that are uh, hideous, uh, you know, if, if a, a, a lonely, uh, uh, never mind, I mean, you know, there, there's, you know, bestiality, things like that are, are, are forbidden because you're different, you know, but you know you're different. And then, okay, so uh, there was a, um, an article published in the Proceeding of the National Academy of the Sciences uh, by um, uh, Stuart Cashmore was his name. Uh, Cashmore is a retired um, biologist from Penn, and he was arguing uh, for a, a reform of the uh, criminal justice system based on a materialist view of human beings. Uh, and and what, what he considers to be the scientifically established fact that you haven't got free will. And he says this in his essay. Uh, not, uh, in order to be clear, I'm not saying that you have no more free will than a fly. I'm saying you have no more free will than a bowl of sugar. Um, and then, then he goes on to, um, uh, you know, to give you reasons why we should uh, therefore reform the, the criminal justice system and so forth. Well, there's lots of things. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's logically self-refuting because he, he smuggles in all these moral norms anyway uh, because he's more human than he's giving himself credit for. But... Um, <laughs> But, but, but the, the simple fact is that you know that you have more free will than a bowl of sugar. You have more free will than a fly. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and you are, what, what the biblical material is, is doing is affirming that, that thing that, that you basically know. And so uh, it, it's more of a cautionary thing um, that, that we mustn't get so caught up with our uh, our glorification of our of our theories that, that we actually override uh, good sense. I, I think that's the way it functions. Anthony Cashmore, that's his name. My bad. What else? <laughs> I believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was intrigued by the way you put it this evening about the six days that there's another day to help them have a chance to have a day of practice, but they were just fascinating because it's not the reason I think it was establishing you know, it. I, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. Thank you. Um, and I'm curious, in my thinking about it that way, how do you really, and I'm looking at this passage and I see it in there, and I do. It's uh, uh, Exodus 31, mm -hmm. the first of the Sabbath. And God rested on the Sabbath and breathed deeply. And he, he had like even the day, he kind of like he was, he was exhausted, so he had to, um, to breathe deeply. Mm -hmm. And all the other uses of that term 
situation with people that's not that's right. Uh, like David and his fellow refugees rest and yeah. they're assault. Um that's a little bit of implications for me in terms of how they were supposed to be reading mm -hmm. what Genesis wanted to say. Okay. How does that affect this notion of felt them to just they practiced it? Right. Right, uh, and so and and the the whole context there of the Exodus 31 passage is uh, it, it resembles in terms of the motivation for keeping the Sabbath. It resembles what's there in the fourth commandment itself in Exodus 20, namely that uh, you're you're doing this as a as a way of imitating God's own behavior. And um, so, if you're an agricultural laborer, resting and getting refreshed or getting your breath back, um, I mean, at, at the very mo at, at the most basic sense you know, is, is very clear to you. Um, and um, so, uh, uh, so, so again, they're, they're seeing them, themselves as in some sense recapitulating the divine activity. Uh, and and ev everybody receiving the, uh, the, the material in Genesis is, you know, they, they've all been through the experience of Exodus 16, which, which is why I can say that that's, they have the, the, set, the work week is set for them in Exodus 16 by the experience there. So uh, again, they're, they're uh, being invited to imitate God, but they're also being invited to use their pre-existing knowledge of God. Well, you know, the God who makes heaven and earth, I, I guess he's not going to get tired. So, uh, you know, you, the, the ability to recognize the analogy would, would then be present for them. Um, and so I... I uh, I really like the approach of Mayer Sternberg in, in reading these narratives, and, and he, uh, I think he's, he helps to appreciate what, it, what an active and responsible reader would do with the text. Um, and, and also, and, and actually, um, just as an aside, I think Sternberg's approach to reading shows that the Apostle Paul was a Sternbergian reader. So Romans 5 is a Sternbergian reading of Genesis 1 to 3. So, um, but but that's that's how how I see it working. Yes, sir. So maybe I'm thinking how would we how would we think a little on maybe this question, how do you help transfer that then from the pulpit down to the reader to teach that in that sense but some of our conversation last night T David Gordon on media ecology and reading text or you think of Peter Weichart and text is a joke and having the sensibility to right. do that or even in the echo of the Lord Hunter for the child. And like, how do we take that and bring that right. to yeah. a lay person so that they learn the sensibility sure. of a text in an age when they don't know how to read any kind of text? <clears throat> Well, you know, it, it, it's sort of a, it needs, the, the cultural commentary needs to be made, you know, that, that, that things like, like humor and irony and, you know, all those sorts of things are, are um, hard to come by. You know, the appreciation for those things are hard to come by these days. Um, and, um, you know, because people go too quickly, you know, that, that's the, the usual reaction to, to the use of, of uh, such um, playfulness. Um, but uh, uh, so, so people can think about what, what it's like to, you know, how, how they might tell their kids a story. So for example, um, uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, I was invited to a conference that was organized by a very, very conservative group uh, in the Presbyterian circles um, on the creation account. And I was invited to come in as a, you know, foreigner and a Yankee and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and um, to, be, be, because the, the people had the decency to, to hear uh, different views and so forth. So, I mean, that's to their credit, I think. Um, and uh, so my, my kids were very, very young, uh, five or six or something like that. And, um, you know, they, they wanted to know what it was like. Because, uh, you know, the, the scene was I'd give my talk and then I'd get all these questions and so forth. And, uh, or, uh, you know, I'd step down from the podium, I'd be surrounded by people who think they have the perfect knockdown answer that'll just put me in my place and so on. And, and my kids were very, very sensitive to that. So they asked me how it went and I told them, well, there were thousands of them and they just kept coming and I kept swinging and every time I'd knock one down, five more would step up to take his place. But I kept swinging and when it was over, they were lying in heaps at, uh, at my feet and I was still standing. Um, so they, they, they got perfectly well 
what, what I was talking about. They were not misled by the, uh, the, the way in which I told the story. Um, and uh, so, you know, you, you can, uh, I, I think people have to appreciate, uh, you know, actual human beings do stuff like that. Yeah. Well, if, what would you say to someone who writes that the first is sort of not a scientific text, but then says, nevertheless, I can speak to scientific texts? Uh, like, would you would you grant that it could, in principle, contradict scientific texts, or is it a different kind of thing? Well, it. I mean, it all it all depends. I, I I think it does contradict the scientific text of Anthony Cashmore, for example, uh, but. Uh, but but what, what it, the way it contradicts is by preserving the good sense necessary to realize that that's all bosh. Um, so I, 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 that, that's, so I, I, yeah, sure. So, um, uh, you know, you can get an over-reading uh, of the text, like, like with the kinds and the immutability of the kinds and so forth. But w what's interesting is how different uh, Genesis is from Aristotle's discussion of the immutability of the kinds. And we, we ought to appreciate that Aristotle's the guy who's interested in that subject. Um, and Genesis is really different. So, I mean, we ought to appreciate that. I just do what you tell me to do, so, you know. Any other last questions? I know it's just about time. Right, why don't we uh, thank Jack for his time. <laughs>